So my two Twitter identities, Just Tech, which is professional, Fiji 2 that's my personal one. And as it says, no one else would be so stupid to post tweets like that. Okay, who am I? At the moment, I'm co-founder and lead Crisis Mappers UK. I'm a member of the International Crisis Mappers. I'm team leader for Humanity Road, community leader for Ushahidi, member of Standby Task Force, project lead for Just Tech, a member of VIAG, member of ROC, member of UN Women, member of UN Spider, and this year I was awarded the gold medal for humanitarian and voluntary services by President Obama. <laughs> One of the questions is going to be, who is President Obama? Anyway, so I'm going to talk about, um, for a start, Crisis Mappers. Um, crisis Mappers UK is a localised network of UK-based crisis mappers, and it's actually affiliated to crisismappers.net, which is the international body. Crisis Mappers leverage mobile and web-based applications maps and crowdsourced event data, aerial and satellite imagery, geospatial platforms, advanced visualization, live simulation, and computational and statistical models to power effective early warning for rapid responses to complex humanitarian emergencies. So you can actually see we've moved on a bit from Twitter, but Twitter is at the heart of it still. Um, the International Network of Crisis Mappers is the largest and most active international community of, of experts, practitioners, policy makers, technologists, researchers, journalists, scholars, hackers, skilled volunteers, etc. Fact for you, 20 million tweets so far for Hurricane Standy. Okay, I'm going to show you we led the Olympic deployment. We worked with the World Health Organization on this one. We set up a preparedness map that if something happened during the Olympics, we could flip our crowdsourcing map round and become a reactive set of information for people. Um, luckily, we didn't need it to be reactive. Now, let's see if this works. Ha ha, it worked. So this was the crisis mappers map we set up. And then everyone, and the oh, hasn't come up. There should be lots of red dots on that one. So every time someone tweeted using a hashtag, travel problems or anything, that went straight onto the system. And as soon as we verified the information, it, um, showed up on the map so anyone could log in via their phone and look what was going on around in their area and they'd be able to pick it up. The other plus thing was we'd actually pre-plotted all the Olympic stadiums that were going to be used and the nearest hospitals to them etc which we could just put that layer on straight away if something had happened. Another one example, hope this one works properly, is um, you, some of you are probably familiar with the Isle of Wight Festival this year and the debacle with the weather. Well, I actually live on an island between the Isle of Wight and the mainland. No one knows it's there, that's why I live there. And um, we were getting screams of people stranded for hours. Um, there were other people offering help. So we trained six people on the Isle of Wight in 10 minutes we set them up a map of people that needed help and people that were offering help. And then the community set up a Facebook page and actually mapped their needs together. And those are some of the reports that were put in. And then if you click on, we'll go into this more, you can actually, an offer of help. And then if you went in, it would show you what the help was. You can also change the colors so the offers help came up blue and the offers needed came up green. Um, very, very visual tool. Okay, here we go. My previous job, God help them all, I was airfield manager at Heathrow. So we're now on an aviation theme again after the last presentation. 
I took silver command on the BA038777 plane crash we had there um, and worked the command and control structure. The thing that I found from being there and getting involved in social media technology was I couldn't work out that in that vast area we had a field team of 20 people so that's only 20 sets of eyes driving around looking for rubbish, faults, um, near misses, incidents, anything like that. But there are potentially 75,000, 76,500 people with their side IDs that he throw. So that is 76,500 sets of eyes compared to a field team of 20. And I thought, why aren't we using all these eyes? Because you're lucky if they go back to their supervisors. You're lucky if they remember to report it to them. You're even luckier if the supervisor's wrong airfield operations. And by the time we get out there, damage could have been done, whatever. So I designed and implemented um, a basic app for phone to trial that people could actually report via their phone and it would automatically flag up on a similar map to the Ushahidi, but on there, exactly where it was, the incident. Um, everyone had to be registered on the system so that well, they all became trusted sources because we could trace if it was a fake report. And it was, it was eye-opening. Um, the rubbish retrieval, the incident rates, the fault rates just went up enormously. It was absolutely brilliant. This is a whirlwind tour, so bear with me. Okay, I'm team lead for Humanity Road. Rather than me explain what Humanity Road is, um, the founder and head of Humanity Road does a lovely introduction. Here we go. Hi, this is Chris Thompson. I'm president of Humanity Road. Humanity Road is a 501c3 public charity. We provide digital disaster response relief information to the public. What that means is we use internet and mobile-based technology to provide information to the public in a manner that they can re receive easily during disaster, either on the internet or on their mobile device. We work with emergency operations centers, public officials, community groups, colleges, military, and all sorts of, of organizations in order to collaborate to improve the disaster response. And this is our year in review for 2011. First, I'd like to say that Humanity Road was founded in 2010, and throughout 2010, we responded to 73 events online on the internet around the world. It was a busy year. In 2011, we're going to finish the year by responding to over 132 events. All over the world, volunteers are helping during crisis to save lives by verifying and providing information to officials who need that information. Throughout the year, over 132 events, 66% of those were earthquakes. Of those earthquakes, Half of them had potential for coastal impacts, and by coastal impacts, I mean tsunami. They may not have had actual impact, but they had a potential for impact, and it's the type of information we monitor during disaster. We also responded to 10 volcanic eruptions, <coughs> numerous floods, and man-made disasters as well, such as nuclear, oil spills, and other activities like civil unrest. Not only was it a very busy year for disaster, but Community Road also took its message on the road, providing input and speeches and content for various training, seminars, and conferences all over the USA. We also have participated in 10 exercises in 2011. In 2010, there was only one social media exercise all year long, and Community Road participated in that exercise, exercise but in 2011, 10 exercises all around the USA, all over the country, all over the world. 
We partnered with organizations like the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Army, and the U.S. European Command for international disasters exercises. We also conducted an exercise with Samoa. Throughout the year, we also achieved many milestones. In February, we launched our website. We also became a member of the National Emergency Management Association, the Virginia VOAC, the Broward County, Florida Citizen Corps, and GuideStar has listed us as a partner in trust, which means as a nonprofit 501c3 public charity, we've been recognized for our transparency and reporting. That's very important to us. We also throughout the year have collaborated with various universities and researchers have conducted research using community road processes and techniques to improve their curriculum for, for disaster response training. As we look forward to 2012, we'll continue to work on improving and modifying and enhancing our procedures, our documentation, and collaboration with others. I'd also like to take a moment just to say thank you to our volunteers. We have volunteers all over the world, on Stop nearly that. every continent. It is incredibly moving to me to see them every day coming online and verifying and checking and helping each other, teaching. Okay, so Humanity Road, before a disaster happens, if it's a natural disaster, weather, whatever, they will actually have volunteers from around the world starting to collect information and data that the emergency services, governments, etc. will need. So we will start identifying where all the shelters are in the area, where the muster points are, where the Red Cross offices are based, what Twitter hashtags are going to be used. We get the message out to get the social media going. When you get the first responders to come in on the ground and the emergency services, all that information exists. So they start to feed from Humanity Road to what the situation is out there. Fantastic organisation and, as Chris said, it is totally run by volunteers. This clip here, I'm just going to forward because I want you to hear how we get our messages. And I just think it is just wonderful. So that's Humanity Road. Tools we use. My favourite. Has anyone ever heard of a Shahidi? Oh, well done. Oh, two. Anyone else? Oh, brilliant. Okay, do you know what a Shahidi means? Anyone? Testimony in Swahili. Okay, um... Ushahidi was initially developed to map reports of violence in Kenya after the post-election fallout at the beginning of 2008. Ushahidi platform was built as a tool to easily crowdsource information using multiple channels, including SMS, email, Twitter and the web. You can actually get the Twitter platform crowd map up and developed and running within three minutes. It's a quick tool. Ushahidi has been used for election monitoring. It was Liberia um, because they were getting no decent media coverage. They weren't knowing what was going on and they crowdsourced the whole lot. And this was actually done by iLab Liberia. And it's a small little room people set up and a Shahidi has sponsored to get, um, we've had 10 people now qualify through running through this program by learning crowdsourcing. Uh, some other examples, crisis response. This shows you that we can actually do them in any language you want. <laughs> so we also have translators a variety of other maps that have been used. I'm going to go on to an example in a minute and show you through it. This is a brilliant one. This is Harass Map. 
um, in Egypt, they were getting... A lot of women over there aren't very empowered. They can't report rape, crime, abuse, etc. So harassment was sent up for people to text in if they'd been abused, raped. Their details were kept confidential, but you could start to see on the map where the worst areas were for what things, and the police were targeting those areas. And since they first started this program, the numbers have really, really dropped. And that's just through tweeting, through texting, and there are no names that come out on that platform, just the report, because it has to be manually verified and approved on the back end of the system. My passion. This is my absolute passion. Um, just tech. It's a long sentence. Are you ready for this? Empowering women to use emerging technology and tools on the ground in underdeveloped and crisis hit areas for emergency preparedness and incident crisis and disaster react management. Did you get that? That's not one of the questions. Um, I've always been passionate about incident, disaster and emergency uh, since my days as airfield manager at Heathrow. And combining that with the empowering women and the new technologies, I really could see the correlation. So at the third expert meeting at UN Spider, uh, it was decided that I could pick up the project and run with it. Because post-disaster, without going in too heavily, 70% um, of the population that perish or are tied up, incapacitated, are men. So you're left with a lot of women that haven't been trained, they've been used to being in the house, they haven't been allowed to do anything. These are the women that we're trying to capture now to empower, to use this technology, to be the eyes on the ground, because you have all these technology people around the world filling in all this information onto these data systems. We need the people on the ground who are the ones actually involved in it to be able to do the matching, the leading, forward, everything. Um, we did a trial with Samoa. We now have the Samoan government behind us. And it's really, really working well. And to see the difference in communities, because they're learning the maps can't, don't have to be just used for disaster preparedness. They can end up being like a harass map in Egypt. It's opening so many potentials. So that is my passion. Um, I did a simulation last week. I think you'll be interested in this one. I, um, has anyone heard of CDAX? CDAX, no? CDAX is, um, I've got to tell you, CDAX is communicating with disaster affected communities. It's a group of three sets of people, NGOs, media teams, and UN agencies. They decided to run a two-day simulation and actually had actors there. They'd all just arrived off a plane and they had to work out what they were going to do. Ocho wasn't going to be arriving for three days, so they had to sort themselves out. So 70 people were put in a room and they were introduced to the Sultan of South Sedak, a fictional country. Um, they also introduced me as a tourist who was a member of Standby Task Force, which is um, a voluntary organisation that you get requests to go and do geospatial information. And I had a Crisis Mappers t-shirt on. And we had the head of American Red Cross. We had World Health Organisation, World Food Programme. Save the Children, Help the Aged, UN Departments. They were all in this room and they were all trying to find someone to take command. And they turned to me, a tourist who happened to be a volunteer at Standby Task Force, and said, will you lead us all? And I said, I said why me? I said, is it because I have a T-shirt with a badge? And they said, um, no, but you seem to know what you're talking about. And I'm saying, but I'm a tourist. So that carried on. We then did um, an exercise. We had two teams of people. We had, I hope I can get this on the full screen. We had two teams of people. And one team was tasked with identifying 
what categories of information they would like to capture on the map. This list took them eight hours to come up with. So missing people, nutrition, emergency, shelter, everything. My team decided that we're, hang we're wasting too much time here. There's people dying with floods. So from all the information from false Twitter feeds, from Google, everything that we'd already pre-planted, we actually managed to map that we managed to map that infrastructure damage, so damaged bridges all showed up on the map like that. We had um, impassable roads. We had people that needed food. We had food warehouses. Sorry, I have to keep going up to the map. Food warehouses. And we found the logistics centres. We then went back to World Food Programme and said, here we go, here's a map for you. And they said, what's that? Well, that's where your lorries are, that's where your food is, that's where it needs to go, and these are your routes you need to take. How did you do that? And we did that in an hour and a half. It just shows that the skills are out there. It's not who you've got in your company, organisation. There are people out there that will help you. Make it visual, make it easy, make it relevant and verify your data. You get to know who are trusted sources. I mean, this is on a very large scale. Now leading Crisis Mappers UK, one of the problems we have is we need to really get this moving forward within the United Kingdom. We need to get people talking to each other. We need to get the language the same. We need to get out to the public to start look, knowing where to look. If there's a problem, what the hashtag's going to be, where they'll find a hashtag, what to follow. It's the basics we need to go back to. And this is where we're really trying to work together and push this forward. I'll stop preaching in a minute. Uh, bear with me. You're nearly there. Okay. GIS. Have you all heard of GIS? Brilliant. So you'll understand all that. These subjects that I've covered are very, very, very short. There are hundreds out there. There's global imaging, there is map action, there are so many tools. If anyone wants any more advice, please just let me know. But if you looked at, remember the second slide where it said, um, who I am, who am I? You had a great list of things. Well, on top of that, and it's my final slide, I also have my own company, Just Combs. I'm also a mother of four and a grandmother of one. I know I don't look old enough, thank you very much. But this shows you that you can do all this in your spare time. But be careful because it's addictive. <laughs> Once you get in there, I mean, I don't know, the future's out there. Everything's changing every day. Just keep up to date with it and think bigger than Twitter. Okay. I'll probably take that picture of me off the screen though. <laughs> <laughs> Questions?